Matt Levi Investigates, brought to you by Ben Cayetano. BEI Hawaii, Hawaii's largest distributor of industrial chemicals, fertilizers, and agricultural products. The Gas Company, Hawaii's clean energy upgrade. HMSA, to keep our community informed and engaged. Hawaii Government Employees Association, working together for Hawaii. Hawaiian Electric Company, supporting a clean energy future for Hawaii. And Kamehameha Schools, celebrating 125 years for Hawaii's people, for Hawaii. I'm Matt Levi. I've been a private detective in Hawaii for nearly 25 years. Join us tonight as we again go on the streets and behind the headlines. All I remember seeing is my blood and my hair running down the drain, you know, and he then drug me into my living room and he started raping me in my own living room. He raped me and he continued to beat me until I passed out. And when I woke up, I, all I seen was my hair and blood surrounding me and no one was around, he had left. No one came to save me, no one heard me. I felt like no, no one heard me screaming. And at that point, I remember laying there, crying out to God, like, why did this happen? You know, I never asked for this. And pleading from within that, I just want a better life. Tonight, a story of courage. A local girl trapped in the nightmare of prostitution in Hawaii. Hers is a story both terrifying and almost impossible to imagine. But it is a story played out every minute on Hawaii streets, in hotels and massage parlors, and in private residences. This girl was lucky. She escaped and now is dedicating herself to rescuing others from the life she was once forced to live. Tonight, inside the hidden world of sex trafficking in Hawaii. Waikiki, any late night or early morning, women and girls walking the tracks. The tracks, Kuhio Avenue between Seaside and Kanekapole, where the sex trade is conducted. Turned out on the street by pimps, many have not chosen this lifestyle, but find themselves hopelessly and dangerously victims of forced prostitution. They are first befriended by a pimp, and then quickly coerced and abused to the point where going to authorities and trying to quit the game becomes nearly impossible. You gotta remember that they're, they're being put in a very difficult position because they're afraid uh, of their pimps. Um, they, get, they get a regular beating, uh, they're, in, they're, they're raped by them, they're abused by them, and they're used by them. So the shame of it is it's the only person they can turn to. You know, their, their pimp at that point in their life is the only person that matters to them. The category of prostitution called sex trafficking is in many ways a misunderstood label. It is often confused with human trafficking, which does have a sexual exploitation component, but human trafficking usually relates more to forced labor in areas such as those involving agricultural workers. Federal law defines the crime of sex trafficking as causing an underage girl or boy, a child under the age of 18, to become involved in sex for profit, or forcing an adult to become involved in the sex trade through fear or threats of violence. Many people believe prostitutes choose to sell their bodies on the street. Some do, but most victims of sex trafficking are disenfranchised girls who have run from dysfunctional family situations first befriended by pimps looking to exploit them, then forced to work in brothels or as street walkers or escorts. And they are often very young. You know, the average age these people target uh, for, for uh, child prostitution is 11 to 14 years old. I mean, that's, you know, pretty unbelievable. Charles Goodwin is former special agent in charge of the Honolulu Division of the FBI. Obviously, some people get into the business of their own volition because it is profitable. 
no question about it. And the people, the, the pimps that, that operate these girls, they make good money. The girls, if they're professional, make good money. The problem is the younger people that are recruited into the business, usually it's going to involve drugs, it's going to involve some violence, it's going to involve coercion. Uh, many of them don't get into it of their own volition. They're recruited by these people, uh, they're, they're uh, taken care of for a period of time, and it's a gradual recruitment and development into it. And once they're into it, it's very difficult for them to get out for a number of reasons. I mean, the, the uh, pimps may threaten them, they may threaten their families, so there's coercion, there's off, often violence and threats involved, so it's, it's not an easy life. Part of a pimp's skill set is timing. He hangs around malls, schools, coffee shops, and nightclubs, and identifies lost and vulnerable young women, desperate to feel wanted or valued. Most of them, as children, are not interested in the trade. What they're interested in is a safe place to be and somebody to take care of them. And that's, it turns out to be 180 degrees from that being the case, because they are used, strictly used, uh, by their pimp and by, by their customers. So there's nothing glamorous at all about it. I wish I knew what made the pimps tick. Because when you look at inhumanity to another soul, they're stealing the girl's childhood. They're stealing her, her life. Retired family court judge Karen Radius, founder of Girls Court, still sits on numerous community boards geared toward teenage girls. She is active in helping victims of sex trafficking. Even if her life wasn't the best life in the world, they're stealing that. They're gaining for themselves, and uh, I don't know how they sleep at night. And it's been said that this human trafficking is essentially slavery in the 21st century. And the thought that they think they can buy and sell these women is just incredible. After identifying potential girls to join his family or stable, the pimp plays to their vulnerabilities with gifts, compliments, protection, and many times drugs. From that grooming comes then um, requiring the girls to, quote, pay back. And that begins the, the evil spiral. But fancy clothes, luxury cars, and kind words are no compensation for the horror of captivity or the degradation and humiliation that comes with selling their bodies for money that is then turned over in full to their captor, the pimp. Many girls try to escape, but any attempt can lead to violence and retribution from the pimp because of an unwritten code, run and your entire family will be in danger. The risk alone can be enough to keep a prostitute in the game. Once the first step into prostitution is taken, the next steps are faster and harder to control. When we return, how one local woman became part of Hawaii's hidden world of prostitution. Hers became a lifestyle of violence and desperation. Next, Kalei's story. They may be easy to spot in Waikiki, but most victims of sex trafficking are not visible and walking the tracks. Instead, they are rotated between the streets, for purchase on the internet, sold as escorts, or corralled into brothels, thinly disguised as massage parlors. These relaxation parlors can be found across Oahu, but are mainly concentrated in the Ala Moana Keaomoku area, we were told there are dozens of brothels in operation 24 hours a day with brightly lit open signs signaling that inside there are girls for sale. This building in Kaka'ako has drawn much attention from authorities in recent years. A potential customer approaching well-lit open doors on the top floor will send those in charge into a unique sales pitch to a prospective buyer. Come on in. 
Where's the two, the two places for us? That have a beautiful lady too. Behind you. Oh. Go inside. No need to be Go inside. Once a deal is made for a date or a massage, a customer doesn't always find an experienced companion brought here from the mainland or a foreign country. Sometimes they find someone like Kale, a local girl born and raised on Oahu. She says her parents raised her well. She attended a private school, graduated from college, had a good job, got married, and had a child. After her marriage ended, she tried to rebuild her social life by going out. One night, she met a man at a Waikiki nightclub who seemed nice and normal. For two weeks, they went on dates, and things seemed to be going well. He was very interested in learning about her family and her young child. This, she says, was the beginning of her nightmare. He took me down to Waikiki, um, and showed me what they call tracks. And these are where these girls uh, prostitute themselves. And he told me, this is what you'll be doing for me. And at that point, of course, I didn't agree, you know, and, um, but he knew so much about me. He knew my daughter, he knew where I lived, he knew my family. Um, so he used that to threaten me. And he, you know, threatened to come after my daughter, uh, my family. Two weeks into the game, when I started, I, I wanted to get out. So from that moment on, I made many attempts to try to get out. I ran away countless times. So every time I ran away from this, this pimp, he would always find me. He beat me worse, and every time I ran away and he found me, it would get worse and worse each time. How much money were you making in a day? Um, well, it started off as um, a thousand dollars a night, um, and then it then increased um, because at that point, um, off of one date, they call them, it could be from a minimum of three thousand. Um, so, at that point, I didn't really have a exact quota, but the expectations uh, were that I bring in a lot more money than I was. If I didn't make that certain amount, that certain quota, I'd have to go out and figure out how to get more. Um, I was placed in different avenues of being prostituted, whether it be online, um, whether it be through the newspaper. I'd have to be on the different tracks in Waikiki and downtown Honolulu. Some days I wouldn't sleep for the longest time period was about three days that I wasn't able to sleep because he kept, every time I would fall asleep, he would beat me until I wake up and I have to go make more money. And it would be a constant threat on my life. And you turned all the money over to him. Mm -hmm. And what did he give you? Um, things, you know, anything a girl could ever dream of, clothes, jewelry, um, nice cars, and beautiful places to stay um, in the Hawaii Kai area. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it wasn't worth it. A prisoner of sex trafficking, Kalei suffered through two horrifying and violent years on the streets and in brothels. She endured countless beatings at the hands of her pimp. She recalls the worst incident. He hid in her closet inside her apartment. She had disobeyed his order to go home when he told her to. When Kalei got back to her apartment, he attacked. As I entered my room, he broke down the closet door and started beating me repeatedly. Um, he kept beating me, kicking my side. Um, he then drug me to the bathroom had a pair of scissors on the counter and he started cutting my hair. He threw me in the bathtub and kept beating me and beating me and every time I tried to get out, um, he'd beat me down back into the tub. And I remember screaming, just crying out that someone would help me, you know, someone would hear my voice, someone would know that I'm in danger. I just felt at that point 
like, God, you should just take my life because I don't want to continue. But something on the inside of me just held, you know, allowed me to hold on, you know, a few more days. And um, I did. But I really, at that point, was at the bottom of my pit. And I just wanted to give up. Um, but there was a little fight still inside of me that knew that, you know what, you're, you weren't created to just be a prostitute. Kalei knew that she needed to escape from her pimp, but had to wait for just the right moment. Until then, she continued to work the streets here and was flown to Las Vegas and other cities to service customers. Finally, her opportunity came on a trip to the mainland when her pimp was arrested. That gave Kalei the chance she needed. When I came home, I knew that that was my time to break free and I was able to take the steps to change my life. So when I came home, I realized, you know, my last, I didn't know where else to go or what else to do. So I turned to church. They didn't know what I've come from, but they were just open and willing to help me every step of the way. And each and every day, they were always there with me. That's where my healing process had to begin because I was destroyed from the inside and um, all of that had to be restored, had to be rebuilt. And honestly, turning to God is the ultimate way that I was able to receive that, you know, and um, I'm really thankful for, you know, for everything that, um, yeah. <laughs> Even with her mind made up to make a change, it took time for her to completely break free and rebuild her courage and self-esteem. Today, Calais is an outspoken advocate for women and girls trapped in the nightmare of sex trafficking. She spends her time talking to women of all ages and walks of life in hopes of raising awareness of the tragic consequences of the lifestyle she is lucky to have survived. Um, it's important for people in Hawaii to know what sex trafficking is because a lot of people think that it happens in foreign countries, it doesn't happen here in Hawaii, it can't happen to you or anybody in your family or anyone that you know. In looking for the solution to the problem of sex trafficking, those we spoke with said it is not simply a matter of more legislation. Passing laws is not the answer. Um, you know, the resources, clearly police departments are strapped for resources. And again, addressing technically lower level criminal problems uh, when you're faced with much more serious criminal violations is, is a big issue. And so I guess, uh, you know, additional resources, you know, uh, the ability for the police to uh, field more people to, to work these cases might be one solution. Um, I don't think there is any simple solution. There's no, there's no uh, silver bullet for the problem. Victims fear coming forward, so pimps are rarely prosecuted. Arrest statistics are misleading because many girls are classified as runaways and not as prostitutes. Those selling themselves under the iron fists of pimps are victims of what seems to be a perfect criminal enterprise. As far as statistics are concerned, we take the position that one is too many. Right, exactly. But again, uh, from, from a law enforcement standpoint, where are you gonna allocate your resources? And that may not be the popular answer, but if you look at what a police department has to deal with, um, certainly if there's a child involved and you know that that's the case, then that ought to be a high priority. But without victims lodging complaints and following through, arrests and prosecutions cannot be made. The head of the U.S. Attorney's Office Criminal Division, Les Osborne, feels the frustration of not being able to do more to help victims. So in all honesty, as a law enforcement prosecutor, you really don't have any idea how large the numbers are in, in underage sex trafficking. That's correct. Does that bother you in any way? Well, of course it bothers me. Uh, our job is to make the community a safer and better place in which to live. And if we don't know what the major problems in the community are, we can't do our job. They have to realize that 
the only way other young girls and young boys in some situations can be saved from the same trap that they fell into is to have courage to help us stamp out the people who are responsible for having so ruined their lives. It takes a lot of courage to get out, not only to get out yourself, but then to say honestly what happened to you, to not be afraid that, and maybe she is still afraid, but to stand up to that uh, for fear that will somebody come back and in any way threaten her, threaten her family, take actions against her. I cannot think of a better service to the community that a person who has fallen into this life uh, can perform than helping others avoid it. I'm living proof that whatever you're going through, it's possible to turn that around and make a difference. And that's really my goal, to not reach out to these current victims of sex trafficking, but help them transition into becoming a survivor of sex trafficking. To Collet, much credit must be given to not only escape the prison of forced prostitution, but to have the courage to speak publicly about her experience so that others might come forward and get help. We thank her, and we thank you for joining us. I'm Matt Levi. Good night. Matt Levi Investigates, brought to you by Ben Cayetano. BEI Hawaii, Hawaii's largest distributor of industrial chemicals, fertilizers, and agricultural products. The Gas Company, Hawaii's clean energy upgrade. HMSA, to keep our community informed and engaged. Hawaii Government Employees Association, working together for Hawaii. Hawaiian Electric Company, supporting a clean energy future for Hawaii, and Kamehameha Schools, celebrating 125 years for Hawaii's people, for Hawaii.